afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the scholarly director of the McCacken Institute for Public Policy and Governance. Uh, thanks so much for coming. We would uh, like to begin by acknowledging that we're Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are all treaty people. Uh, we'd like to welcome our online audience as well as our in-person audience. We'd like to remind everybody that our final Policy Matters panel will take place in two weeks' time. So. Next week, you're going to have to do without Policy Matters. My apologies in advance, but in two weeks' time, we'll have our last panel. Next week is a break on campus, so there will be no class and no panel. But uh, in two weeks' time, we'll have our final one. It is called Not All Fun and Games, Difficult Decisions and Trade-Offs in Cultural and Recreational Infrastructure. It will feature Daryl Dexter uh, as chair, uh, Gil Dares, Bill Greenlaw, Asha Khan, and uh, yours truly, Kevin Quigley. I'll just mention that the panel in two weeks' time, in some respects, it's not exactly the same topic that we're talking about today, but there's a little bit of crossover. We have done some research at the McCacken Institute recently about how to make decisions around cultural recreational infrastructure investments. So we're talking about museums and arenas and community centers and things like that. So we're gonna have a couple of folks come and talk about their experience of building cultural recreational infrastructure and how they did it, the public engagement piece, et cetera. And I'll be presenting some of the research that we've done on that topic around cultural recreational infrastructure and things that we have to take into account when we're building it. Because uh, it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time to build and it's uh, really deeply embedded in communities so it's important that we, that we do it well. So if you're interested in this topic today, I certainly encourage you to come in a couple weeks' time. We're going to talk about uh, some of the issues uh, maybe on the periphery of this uh, public-private partnerships discussion. So please come uh, in two weeks. Uh, I'll also uh, put out a reminder that BuzzFeed media editor uh, Craig Silverman will be speaking at the University of King's College on Thursday at 7 p.m. You can find out more on King's website or from the flyers at the front desk. I will also uh, ask that if you're a member of the media today, and I think we might have some members of the media, if you'd like to speak to one of our panelists, um, we can arrange that, but I would ask that you speak to Warren McDougall first. Warren is sitting in the table outside, and Warren will coordinate any media requests for one-on-one -on -one discussions with the panelists. But the panelists are running on a schedule, so they have to go to lunch, et cetera, et cetera, so please connect with Warren first, and Warren will organize uh, a meeting for you with, uh, with one of our panelists if you'd like to have such a meeting. Uh, I'm delighted to say that Mary Brooks is uh, our chair today. Dr. Mary Brooks is a professor emerita at Dalhousie University's Rose School of Business and a founding editor of Research and Transportation Business and Management. Mm -hmm. In 2016, she was appointed chair of the Marine Board of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. She recently chaired the Council of Canadian Academies' assessment of the value of commercial marine shipping to Canada. Her research focuses on competition policy in the liner shipping, port strategic management, and short sea shipping. She has authored and published more than 25 books and technical reports more than 25 book chapters, and more than, 100, uh, more than 80 articles in peer-reviewed scholarly journals. She is a, a co-winner of the 2018 on Onassis Prize in Shipping, which is a very distinguished uh, honor indeed. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Mary Brooks. Well, we're coming up on 30 years since the development of new public management, with its focused on a changed role for government. Moving from the fox being in charge of the chicken house, as it was seen at the time, because government was both the regulator and operator of many entities, to an era where the art of the deal needs to be done right in order to account for risks, rewards, accountability, and responsibility. The questions all boil down to who bears the risk? What if there's not enough traffic? Or what if the public interest is not looked after? Who gets the reward? Governments, the public sector, the partner in the par partnership from the private sector. If it's done right, it should be win-win-win. So it's common to find public-private partnerships out there in many forms. And so I'm hopeful that today we'll see our, our speakers give us greater clarity on what makes them work and how to make them successful and when they're appropriate. They will have um, 12 minutes each to provide opening comments. After that, we will have three uh, students uh, ask questions from the public, uh, sorry, the Masters in Public Administration class, and then we will open questions up to the floor. So hopefully today's speakers will help us move forward because after 30 years of 
a lot of public-private partnerships happening um, in today's government. It's time to do a much better job in a digital era, and I'm looking forward to what they have to say. Our first speaker today, I'm going to introduce all three and then um, uh, ask them to, 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 to give their remarks, is um, Matty Sima Tiki, and he is a Canada Research Chair in Infrastructure Planning and Finance and Interim Director of the University of Toronto School of Cities. His work focuses on delivering large-scale infrastructure projects, public-private partnerships, and the effective integration of infrastructure into the fabric of cities. His recent studies explore the value for money of delivering infrastructure megaprojects through public-private partnerships, the causes and cures for cost overruns on large-scale projects, and the development of innovative mixed-use buildings and the diversity gap in the infrastructure industry workforce. He's a frequent media commentator on urban planning and served on the board of directors of the public agency Waterfront Toronto. He has a PhD in community and regional planning from the University of British Columbia. Next to uh, Maddie is Paula Flesch. Paula is an experienced senior executive and strategic advisor in government, academia, and economic development, and has had a varied career in both public and private sectors. On June 11, 2012, he was appointed Deputy Minister for the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. He currently serves as past president of the Association of Professional Geoscientists of Nova Scotia and is a licensed vocational education teacher with a diploma in adult education from Nova Scotia Community College. He has master's and doctorate degrees from McGill University, a Bachelor of Science from Loyola College of Concordia University, and a master's in public administration from Carleton University. Our third speaker at the end of the table is Ray Mitchell. He's a lawyer practicing in Halifax, and for the past 20 years, his legal practice has focused on the construction industry labor relations. He provides legal advice and services to numerous construction labor organizations and regularly appears before arbitrators, labor boards, and other administrative tribunals, as well as the courts in all four Atlantic provinces advocating on behalf of organized labor. He has extensive experience with collective bargaining and advising unions and their associated trusts on strategic policy and governance issues and is a regular presenter at legal education programs speaking on these topics. So I hope you will welcome our speakers and I'll ask uh, Matty uh, Simi Atiki to come up and um, uh, give his first, uh, his first talk, his introduction. Thank you, Mary. Um, I wanna thank uh, Kevin uh, for the invitation, uh, Warren for uh, uh, coordinating uh, and helping me get here. Um, it is a great pleasure to be with you uh, today to speak about public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships are uh, a model of delivering infrastructure that, uh, that uh, societies have been grappling with for hundreds of years. We have always had relationships between the public sector and the private sector to deliver infrastructure. Right back to the early shipping, uh, concessions uh, and the road uh, turnpikes uh, that, we, that, uh, that our uh, countries had. So public-private partnerships are nothing new, but they have re-emerged and they've become front and center in how we now think about delivering uh, large-scale public infrastructure. And importantly, they are not just a technocratic approach to delivering infrastructure, uh, they also have uh, deep political dynamics to them. Uh, which helps explain why they are so contentious and why we have forums like this to talk about them, where so many people turn out. And I want to thank you for coming today to uh, hear the debate and discussion about public-private partnerships. Because, again, on one hand, this is a very technical uh, uh, conversation about uh, risk transfer and innovation and value for money and design. And we can talk about it as a technical pursuit. But public-private partnerships are also part of the larger discourse about how we deliver infrastructure and what the optimal role of the government is in protecting the public interest 
and how we integrate that role uh, with uh, the private sector who, uh, under the right conditions, can bring uh, innovation and efficiencies uh, to uh, the provision of large infrastructure. So we have to think about public-private partnerships within this broader context as both technocratic and part of our, our broader uh, political debates about the role of the public and the private sector. So what is a public-private partnership? This is a question that uh, has, has uh, uh, puzzled uh, scholars uh, and practitioners for a long time. And to give you a single definition is not really possible. Public-private partnerships, rather, sit on a much broader spectrum of approaches to the way that governments work together with the private sector to deliver infrastructure. For the purpose of today's discussion, I think what the way we'll be describing public-private partnerships is as part of a long-term uh, concession model of project delivery. So what happens is the public sector comes up with, or the government or an agency comes up with uh, an, an idea of, of a piece of infrastructure that they want to deliver, let's say it's a hospital or a school or a courthouse or a road or a transit project uh, or a recreation center, they then put out a, a, a proposal or a brief out into the marketplace and ask for the private sector to come forward with proposals on how they would uh, do some combination of facility design, construction, financing, operations, and maintenance. And it doesn't have to be all of those pieces of the bundle. We call that the bundle of services. Design, build, finance, operate, maintain. It's some components of those, depending on the type of project we're delivering, that get bundled together to form the public-private partnership. Now, most public-private partnerships have two key components. One is private finance. So there is a private finance role where the private sector will invest in the capital cost of the project upfront and be repaid for, for that initial capital investment over the lifespan of the contract. So the second component is that it has a long-term operating component where the private sector is involved in operating and maintaining the asset to some varying degree. Now, it does differ depending on the type of asset. So if we're talking about a road, the private sector might be responsible for actually operating uh, the road and, and in, in some cases collecting the tolls if there's tolls on that facility. Uh, so they might do the snow clearance and they might do the road maintenance. In the case of, of, of social infrastructure, hospitals or schools or courthouses, what we found is that, the, uh, that, that the, the private sector might be responsible for maintenance of the facility, so they might maintain the building envelope, make sure the boilers and chillers work over an extended period of time, make sure the windows uh, don't leak air, uh, for example, um, and make sure the elevators work. But they're not responsible for the clinical services or the provision of the educational services uh, in, in the schools. So there is a division there, and it can vary depending on the type of uh, project uh, delivery model that is selected. So the public-private partnership can sit on a spectrum then from greater public responsibility, where the public sector continues to maintain considerable responsibility, especially for service provision and designing the service and service standards as compared to at the, at the further end of private responsibility where the private sector then takes responsibility for all of those bundled aspects of design, build, finance, operate, maintain. What we've seen in Canada, Canada is, has become a global leader in the delivery of public-private partnerships over the last 25 years. So since, uh, since the mid-1990s, Canada has delivered around 215 public-private partnerships, either completed and in operation or currently under construction. So it is a very big number. The majority of those projects are in Ontario, uh, in, in uh, British Columbia, uh, in Quebec, and in, in Alberta. That's where the majority of them are. There have been a, a handful in the Maritime Provinces and a few here uh, in uh, Nova Scotia. So what we've seen in terms of the evolution is that in the early period of public-private partnerships, in the, in the late 90s and into the early 2000s, the goal of the public-private partnership was in many ways to, to transfer as much risk and responsibility to the private sector. Governments were often lacking in money, they didn't want to take on public debt, and what they saw public-private partnerships as is a mechanism to get the private sector to deliver infrastructure that they didn't want to do on their own. And this led to uh, some deal structures that were uh, not advantageous to the public sector. Too much risk and responsibility was transferred to the private sector, and what it meant is that the deals, uh, they were inflexible. If ever there was a need to change the, the infrastructure itself, to make changes uh, to the service, or to make changes to the, to the fare structure, uh, or to change the building, those were very difficult to make, and the public-private partnership 
in, in many cases was expensive because of the uh, high degree of private financing that was involved in those type of early deals. So the early deals in Canada uh, mirrored the models that were used elsewhere around the world and really had a very mixed result. And Nova Scotia fits within that trajectory, uh, first with your highway project, uh, and, and more recently with the schools, uh, with the legacy of the Nova Scotia Schools Public-Private Partnership, which the Auditor General of Nova Scotia has now reviewed uh, and, uh, and questioned how, uh, questioned the, the degree to which uh, uh, the contract uh, uh, was being enforced and whether the risks were actually appropriately transferred over the long term to the private sector. And what we've seen is that that contract has now been bought out uh, and brought back, uh, much of it has been brought back in house at considerable expense. Now, the newer public-private partnerships that we see, uh, the ones in British Columbia, the ones in Ontario and elsewhere, have tried to rebalance the nature of the relationship between the public and the private sector and to create a larger role for the public sector. The earlier ethos, the, early, the initial ethos of public-private partnerships was that the government either didn't have the expertise or didn't have the money uh, and resources to deliver projects and we had to transfer that to the private sector. The more recent approach is that we're really targeted towards value for money and that government can deliver projects effectively and that what a partnership means is actually that you have two skilled partners and two equal partners transferring not the maximum amount of responsibilities but the right responsibilities and risks to the private sector. And so what we've seen is a rebalancing in many of the deals so that the public sector plays a much larger role in, um, in, in the upfront designing of the facility. They may finance actually quite a significant component. So there's public financing and private financing. It's not just a private finance deal. And uh, on, the, on the long term end of, of the deals, what we've seen is that uh, the government takes, takes on a larger role for uh, operating the services, and in many cases has removed some of the parts of facility management and maintenance that were becoming contentious. For example, security services or cleaning services. Uh, or food services in a hospital, the types of services that really come into contact with the user, and the user has a real living experience with those services, those were often challenged in public-private partnerships. Increasingly, those are remaining in-house, and the government is providing those services, whereas the private sector takes on a larger role for maintaining the building envelope uh, and making sure that, that, that good maintenance under contract stays in place. Now, in my remaining few minutes, let me just reflect then on what leads to a successful public-private partnership. Because the line really on public-private partnerships is if you've seen one public-private partnership, you've seen one public-private partnership. Each one of these deals is different. Each one of them has its local context and its local particularities. And uh, in order to understand if you're getting a good deal or not, you need to really uh, dissect and understand the context in which it's being made, the reasons why the public-private partnership model is being used, and how the contract is really drafted. So when people ask, are public-private partnerships good or bad? The answer is really, it depends. And let me give you a sense of, of, of some conditions that it depends on. First and foremost, it depends on the contract. Is it actually a good contract? Did you get a good deal? We shouldn't expect that every public-private partnership is good or bad. It's really in the nuance of the deal. What are the costs associated with the public-private partnership and what are the benefits? The contract is central to understanding how that's being achieved. So the first thing is write a good contract. The second thing is the, the public sector needs just as good expertise as the private sector. These are complex deals that are going to last in many cases for decades and the public sector needs the skilled expertise on their side of the deal to be able to negotiate with uh, concessionaires and contractors who do this for a living and are willing to pay for the best experts because there's a lot of profit and resources at the end of it if they get an advantageous deal. The government needs to have the expertise in-house on their team to make sure that they're negotiating uh, the best deals. And finally, the contracts that, that do get written actually have to get enforced and monitored. One of the real challenges that the Auditor General highlighted with the Nova Scotia Schools uh, PPP is that even after uh, the project was underway, there wasn't sufficient monitoring uh, of the contract and the penalties uh, for non-performance were not always being enforced as well as they could. The contract is only as good as uh, how well it's enforced. We need to have uh, monitoring and we need to have uh, governments that have the expertise and the capacity to then enforce those contracts, levy the penalties where they're due, and provide uh, plaudits when the private sector does a good job. So to conclude, 
the public-private partnership model is not a cheap way of delivering infrastructure. Let me be explicitly clear about that. You will often hear people say we're doing public-private partnerships to save money. You may be, but it's not for the reason you think. Public-private partnerships have significant additional upfront costs. They have upfront costs for the planning. It takes a lot of consultants and lawyers and the government in-house staff cost money. They are expensive because they, uh, they work in, in, in specializations that, that, are, uh, uh, that require a lot of expertise and training. And then the private finance. The cost of private finance can be two to three times higher than the cost of government borrowing. So why would you ever do one of these deals if it's more expensive up front? The reason is around risk transfer. The reason is that you can, if, if the project is efficiently and appropriately designed, you can transfer risks for cost overruns and delays that have plagued big pro projects and the problems that arise around operations and maintenance, you can transfer those to the, to the private sector and achieve what's called value for money. Not necessarily the lowest cost up front, but the value for money. Just like all of us in this room, if you own a house or own a car, you have an insurance policy on both of those, you are essentially trying to buy an insurance policy against future risks materializing. But you will only achieve that benefit if the contracts are well written and if you have the skills and capacity to enforce them. So my concluding remarks is public-private partnerships, good or bad, it really depends. Thank you. I'm going to go through a few slides. Uh, we're in the market now on three P3 projects, so I can't say a lot about them. I will obliquely refer to them, um, but I will talk uh, in general about P3s and uh, why the, the government in Nova Scotia has uh, decided to do some over the years, starting in the uh, late 1990s, as Maddie referred to, uh, to up to this day we're doing so. Uh, most of our builds are conventional builds but we have chosen in specific circumstances to do P3s where we feel they make sense. So I'll go through these slides. Do I have the clicker or are you, Mary? I don't have it. You don't have it. Therefore, I have it. <laughs> Look at that. So we've uh, decided in uh, two cases in healthcare and one case in highways to do some P3s. But I want to describe first our larger build in healthcare. We're really renewing the system here in Nova Scotia. It's a once in a generation rebuild. Uh, it's a very large capital spending. Media would love to know the total figure. Of course, we don't know the total figure yet because we're continuously doing the planning and adding to the system so the figure changes. But we have roughly about $3 billion of uh, construction estimated at this time, which includes a big rebuild of our uh, Quaternary and quaternary, uh, tertiary and quaternary hospital system in Halifax in this area, and a large rebuild in Cape Breton, as, sell, as, as well as several other renovations around the province. And you can see them there. The focus of our P3 components, because only a small portion of this is P3, will be at the Halifax Infirmary expansion uh, for, for two specific bills. One is the expansion here downtown, and another is a new site for a community outpatient center we're going to build to serve the suburban areas of Halifax at the Bears Lake Park. So those are where we're doing P3s. The rest is all going to be <coughs> some type of conventional build, and I'll go through that in a minute. Uh, we initially thought we mused, never a good thing to do in the media, we mused about doing P3s for some of the Cape Breton expansion or build, and after getting down to uh, look at the details of those projects, the scale of them, we asked ourselves a lot of questions, I'll show you at the end, we then decided we would not do P3s in Cape Breton, and I'll go through some reasons later. These were the objectives, we had some great objectives, mainly around health care, uh, to better service, to renew our facilities, better service the community, and we were dealing with aging buildings on a uh, second downtown site. Uh, we felt that consolidating on one downtown site uh, would be the best thing to do. 
and uh, to leave uh, the aging facilities. It allows us to renew facilities and to design them for the future of healthcare, which is really critical. We have to have flexible facilities. So I'll go back to what Manny talked about. We have to be careful that if we do P3s, we can do them in such a way they can anticipate future changes in health service delivery. Otherwise, we're gonna be stuck in the same a situation we are now with our aging facilities in that many of them, although they're cherished by their communities and they're truly loved and people have donated to them over the years and in many cases taken incredible care of them, they do not have the flexibility for the future. And in some cases in Cape Breton, that caused a lot of angst when we had to say, no, we have to leave those facilities and build new ones. So the other area we're doing at P3 is in the highway construction. We've done one before in the late 1990s called the Cobacud Pass, a 40 kilometer section. Uh, it was a, a P3 uh, and it was early in the days of P3. So where it fits upon the spectrum is rather interesting. In fact, the, uh, the P3 operator there, surprisingly enough, is another arm of ourselves. It's a crown corporation and the operator, the maintenance operator there, is in fact ourselves, it's the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, and the workers there are represented by the Canadian Union of Public Employees. So it is a P3, but bizarrely, even though a lot of Nova Scotians felt that it was somehow run out of Toronto, only the bondholders are in Toronto. The operations, the Crown Corp, is actually run out of here, the employees are run out of here, and the employees, for the most part, other than the commissioners that take the tolls, are unionized government employees. So it's a, it's a hybrid. Uh, we're gonna do a second P3 on the 104 highway, which is a Trans-Canada. It's a section which will bridge the gap we now have between Pictou County and Ang Anaganish. We just opened the Anaganish bypass about two years ago. So we'll bridge the gap between the two you see up there, and that's out for a P3 right now. That is going to be uh, totally uh, design, build, finance, maintain, operate. But the end, we don't know who will be the operator. It comes come back to the Department of Transportation again. So we'll see what happens when we get the bids in and we see uh, what is the best deal for Nova Scotians. Some of the objectives there would be typical objectives. There's a long stretch there that goes through a valley where there's been a lot of accidents or pre that stretch there's been a lot of accidents. Um, it's a, uh, a, a slow section. Uh, it's got a railway on one side, it's got a river on the other side, and uh, we're gonna twin a new section around the mountain, which should improve safety and uh, allow a uh, safer and more efficient deliver of goods and services to Cape Breton and Newfoundland along the Trans-Canada. So I'm gonna put up here a P3 spectrum. It's a one-dimensional spectrum, goes from one side to the other. Maddie spoke about what is it P3. You can get in a room and spend 24 hours until you fall asleep arguing with people about what, what are P3s and where they are. It's really a spectrum. I'm not sure that anyone's done a true government project outside maybe, you know, the former uh, Enver Hoxha's Al Albania, uh, where everybody was a government worker. So always you're gonna get even what, what people think are government projects now are really somewhere on the P3 spectrum. For instance, we now do a lot of design, bid, build, which is on the uh, very small P3 end of the spectrum of the triangle there. And uh, a lot of those are our schools right now. We did do some schools in the late 90s, which were, uh, were, were true P3s. Further along the spectrum, they would have been in the gray area. Okay, but now most of our school construction is design, bid, build, could be design, or construction management agent, could be uh, CMR. So in that area is where we do most of our schools now. Uh, so there have a lot of private input into them. There is no true other end of the spectrum where P3 goes to exactly zero, where we have our own trades workers building the school. Mm -hmm. We always put it out to bid, uh, I can't think of an example, even in the Western world, maybe these experts could, where the trade workers are government workers, and every single person who hammers a nail is a government person. So somewhere, we're always sharing risk with the private sector. In the most extreme left-end case, it's on the bid.
So they give us a defined bid, and there may be changes to the bid due to scope change or whatever, but it's a defined bid, so we've shared that construction risk with the private sector. We do have, the, as, as I said earlier, we have some schools that would have been at the other end of the spectrum from the 90s. Lessons learned there, and those were some of the first P3s in Canada. What we're looking at now is, uh, in the middle of the spectrum, the DBFM for the two hospitals we're going to build, and a DBFMO for the highway. So that's where we are now, and we did, of course, value for money, but that's not the end of the game. Maddie spoke about value for money. There are other things you might want to achieve, and I'll ask some questions about that later. So the focus on value for money is perhaps sometimes mistaken. Also, there are certain constraints in your regime that dictate things that might not exist in other regimes. For instance, we have constraints on the number of public servants. Uh, I'll go back to a government before the current uh, ex-premier in the room, long before when uh, the media and the premier used to look every month at the number of civil servants, mm -hmm. and there was a societal feeling that we couldn't grow the civil service. So if we took on large generational projects, we couldn't expand the civil service to have the design in-house to do those projects or to manage those projects at that time, or we may not have been able to borrow the money because of financial markets or a debt to GDP ratio. So those things change over time, they change by location, and they dictate where you're gonna be on that P3 spectrum I showed. Risk allocation is an important thing. I always say maybe the most important risk is the risk of having the deputy minister get fired. But uh, I seem to have survived that risk under the previous premier and the current one, but who knows the next one. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, there are other risks that are more important to the public than me getting fired. Um, so uh, we maintain a lot of the risk. We maintain, in all the models except the early P3 schools we did, we maintain ownership. We're going to maintain ownership in the future. Um, so a lot of the risks that people think government should have, we already have, the service delivery side. Mm -hmm. The risks that are transferred to the private se sector, you can see there on the right. Value for money, I think Maddie spoke about that, so I'll pass that over, but it is not the be all and end all. I want to focus on things to keep in mind. So how quickly do we have to do a project? Sometimes, believe it or not, we can do it faster by design build mm -hmm. in-house than we can do it externally. It depends on where our resource level is in-house, mm -hmm. how many other projects we have, what we're doing. Sometimes a P3 is much faster, and we can actually put in clauses to ensure we get the type of timetable we want. Politicians and the people always have a timetable. There might be other things driving the timetable, like the collapse of a building, or we gotta get that bridge put back in place because it's not there, it got washed out. Uh, are there funding issues? Are there funding constraints in government we have to focus on? Those dictate whether we do a P3 or not. Is scope creep a problem? In a political process, you, you uh, factor out the scope creep somewhat in doing a P3. Scope creep is where all along the way you have elections or other things which sort of jam politicians into changing the project as it proceeds. And that can be very dangerous for pricing and timing. Is there pri enough private interest? What if you have only one P3 bidder? Well, that's not very good. If you have 20 bidders, that's great. Then you, you know you're getting a, probably a good deal. But if you're in a jurisdiction, a small jurisdiction, you only have one bidder, this could be a problem. Uh, how much capital construction risk can the government afford? If things go bad, do we have the political will to fix things? I dealt with something really a few years ago that the government didn't have the political will to fix because uh, the withdrawal of service was not politically pa palatable. palatable. Mm -hmm. um, so then it doesn't matter. We were held hostage by the operator. Time is up, so I have a last slide which has another number of questions. But you have to go through these types of, types of questions in order to know that you're doing the right thing by doing a P3 or doing the right thing by not doing a P3. And where in the P3 spectrum should you be? Where is your sweet spot? Thank you.
morning, everyone. I want to thank the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to participate today. This topic is timely, it's interesting, and certainly not without controversy. I want to start by explaining my perspective on this topic. I'm not a scholar in this field. I've never taken any scientific research. That's not the perspective I'm bringing here today. I have over 25 years experience in the construction industry. In fact, I started out in the construction industry as a trades worker, as a journeyman iron worker doing structural steel. And then I became a lawyer and fate brought me back into the construction industry. That wasn't planned, but things work out sometimes as they do. For the last 20 years or more, all of my practice has been in the construction industry. And on a daily basis, I'm helping uh, clients, contractors, unions, workers, managers solve problems. So much of the commentary that I'm going to share with you today is anecdotal as opposed to scientific. And I'm hoping that uh, through the exchange that we have today and the perspective I can share with you and with the other speakers that we can all learn something more and be a little more enlightened about this P3 model. I want to start by uh, sharing with you the first lesson that I learned on the first day of law school in 1990. I'm going to share this lesson with you because I find it applies in many areas of my life and not in law. And I think this lesson will be helpful to you as you consider and analyze this P3 uh, model. Here it is. Nothing in law is black and white. It's a million shades of gray. So, as we debate the issue of P3 procurement today. I'm going to ask you to keep that in mind. It'll be relevant to some of the comments that I'll make at the end of my presentation this morning. So our topic for today was, can P3 agreements generate public value? Well, of course they can. It allows the government to respond to public needs, to access financing, and to take advantage of private expertise. Uh, more very importantly, to transfer and share risk. And clearly there can be benefits to the public because the public wants access to new infrastructure and new services, and this can be achievable through P3 models. It has been in many places and many times. So you have to ask yourself, what's the problem? I said this is a controversial topic. I think you'll agree with me that it is. And by the end of the day, we're probably all going to express some views that uh, well, necessarily aren't in line. I'm sure we have contrary views. So let's start the analysis by looking at what drives public policy. I put a number of them here on the slide for you to look at. Economic condition of finance certainly is a strong driver. Science and technology can be a strong driver. The one I highlight at the bottom of the page is one I'm going to address primarily in my comments and is that of public opinion. Because that's what drives the controversy on this topic. In fact, I'm going to tell you, if you don't already know it, that there's a strong voice that's critical of P3 arrangements. One day, many years ago, I was driving along to work somewhere. I was listening to the radio, and there was a political commentary. And one of the speakers said something that resonated with me that I've kept in mind over the years. And uh, it, it's something I tell other people pretty regularly when we're trying to problem solve in the construction industry. And what the speaker said was that perception is reality. So what's the perception out there in the public when it comes to P3 construction? I can tell you that controversial uh, perspective is readily found anywhere in the media. If you look in the newspapers, if you go to the internet, listen to the radio, and this topic comes out, I'm going to submit to you that the majority of the commentary that you'll see about P3 construction in this province is not positive. It's negative. In preparation for the presentation today, I thought, well, let's just go to the media and see what's out there to help guide me in my comments to you today. So I put on the next couple of slides some of the comments uh, that I found in the media. And these are all headlines. A troubling secrecy. 
Cabo could pass, cost $232 million more. How about this one? Private profit at a public price. That's not what taxpayers want to see in the media. P3 model could add more than $100 million to Highway 20. Advocates say P3 funding model problematic. Another headline says Nova Scotia's foolhardy use of public-private partnerships continues. The P3 party is over in the UK, so why is Nova Scotia embracing the formula? Pondering the P3 school problem. Well, it wouldn't be hard for me to have slide after slide of these types of headlines. So, this is a controversial topic. Today, we have the opportunity to have some debate, sort things out, get a better understanding of the P3 model, and how it might be optimized to make sure that the public is getting good value. So, what are the optics out there? The optics is that the P3 model is short-term gain for long-term pain. That's not, that's not true. I would agree with Maddie's comments on how he described the, uh, the model and how an effective tool it can be. But there's a perception that there's long-term pain with regards to P3 construction. So, you know that there are a spectrum of variables in ownership models, financing uh, models, risk allocation models that can all be adjusted or tinkered to make sure that the P3 contract, that written contract, is optimized for parties. One size never fits all. This is a flexible funding model and just like any contract, whether it's a contract for you to do, for a contract to do work on a structure, uh, or whether it's a, a collective agreement, which is another type of contract, there's an ability, a freedom to bargain in the parties. They sit at the table, they go there informed and prepared, and they decide what it is they want in that contract that suits their needs and their, their longer term goals. So there's my comment again when it comes to P3 contracts, in particular with the design, the negotiation, the written contract, there's many shades of gray. So if I can offer an opinion on P3 construction, the model will work effectively when it strikes an effective balance for funding and risk allocation. And this can be materialized in a contractual relationship, the actual uh, P3 contract. I think it's important that success of the project is managed on an ongoing basis. And as a lawyer, I think it's important that it facilitates communication between the partners to manage expectations. In any partnership, whether it's a social partnership or a business partnership, there's going to be some conflict, sometimes when the parties don't agree. And there must be an effective way to manage conflict and have a dispute resolution process that's effective. I'm also going to submit to you that it's important that public opinion is considered at all stages of the project. Remember in the P3 model, you're looking at long-term projects, relationships that are going to last 20, 25, and 30 years. So I'm going to submit to you that public opinion counts at all stages uh, of that project. One way, which I'm going to uh, say today is a good way to manage uh, the public opinion is through community benefits agreements. This is something that's a, a bit of a buzzword in the construction industry these days. The idea is that in large infrastructure projects, you include agreements that'll help add social value to the project. This is regularly done in major projects across Canada and here in the Atlantic region. Some of the deliverables that community uh, benefits agreements can include are job training, for example, apprenticeship opportunities, uh, target hiring for underrepresented groups, purchasing from local businesses that's awarding contracts, subcontracts on projects to local businesses, ensuring fair wages. 
these sorts of things. So I'm going to conclude by making three points to you. The first is that P3 agreements can be an effective means for government in partnering with the private sector to provide needed infrastructure and services. The second one is that P3 agreements can be tailored to fit the needs of the partners, the project, and the public. There's a bargain to be struck, and I believe the title of our presentation today is The Art of the Deal, and this is particularly relevant to P3 contracts and P3 construction. And my final point is, public opinion in this province demonstrates concerns over the P3 model. Just because people have those opinions doesn't mean they're necessarily correct or they're necessarily true. But these opinions, these contrary opinions, do exist. And as I said earlier in my presentation, perception is reality. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thought-provoking uh, presentations. It's now time to move on to um, the student questions. Our first question will be coming from Noel Guscott. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for an extremely informative presentation today. Um, my question is going to be directed to the Deputy Minister. Uh, so, Mr. Mitchell made a really important point. Uh, managing public opinion for government is really salient and significant. Um, and at least in regards to the recent hospital project, public opinion does seem to be a bit negative. Uh, has the government considered a legislative policy option uh, to implement some sort of transparency mechanisms, either, like I said, through legislation or perhaps through the establishment of an in-house agency or crown corporation or department that specifically manages P3s and can provide this information uh, to the public so they can be involved throughout the entire uh, procurement and negotiation process? Thank you. There is a, was a Crown Corporation, uh, we did sort of a, a Toronto stock market deal where we had an existing shell Crown Corporation, the CEO of it is up there. Uh, he's the oldest public admin student here, I think. Um, and um, uh, we used that corporation to actually set up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the agency which will uh, manage the build and, uh, and, and also uh, manage the, the contracts that are Develop. So yes, we already looked at that. I'm not sure about the legislation comment, but uh, in in terms of I think the importance of uh, uh, we learned from the Auditor General's report, we learned from experience in other jurisdictions that the ability to um, manage the contracts through the life of the contract is critically important. In the case of the schools, we were coming near the end of the contract. There was transitions in government, and uh, you know we probably. Uh, uh, needed to do a, a very uh, much earlier review and, and, and uh, management of those contracts. They were signed in the 90s. They were very different types of contracts. So today's contracts will be done and managed in a very different way. Contract preparation is something that uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell spoke about and I think I don't know if it's fully appreciated the amount of work that goes in the front end of a contract. So that's one of the things sometimes that P3s can actually, at the front end, look slower. And they might arrive at the same time scale, but, but the construction activity, which a lot of people are excited about, they want to see, see machinery moving on a site, can actually be delayed in a P3 that is further out on the right of the spectrum I showed than the left end uh, because of the need to get those contracts very, very detailed at the front end to ensure that the public gets the deliverables, deliverables that it needs. So um, that's another thing. Sometimes machinery rolling is an important public objective to satisfy the public that something is happening. And sometimes P3s, uh, because of the contract, uh, negotiate the front end, cannot deliver the machinery as fast. The end date may be, in fact, faster, but the machinery rolling isn't. Um, Matty Semyutiki had decided he'd like to talk on that too. So, Matty, over to you. Uh, I want to pick up specifically on your comment about uh, transparency 
uh, of, of public-private partnerships. Uh, in 2008, I wrote a paper uh, in the Journal of Man American Planning Association called What's the Secret? where I looked at, I did, uh, I got access to uh, many of the documents that were uh, often not made public uh, with public-private partnerships and tried to explore what was actually in those documents, what was not being communicated to the public. Um, and in, in many instances, um, there were commercially sensitive, there was commercially sensitive information in them. Uh, what, what happens in a public-private partnership, and this has been one of the challenges in terms of the perception, is that when you're negotiating with uh, a, a, a private sector actor to get the best deal for government, there is a need to withhold some information so that you're not negotiating with your hand open while they have their hand close to the vest. That's, that's a quick way uh, to, get a, to get a bad deal. Um, but what we also found is that there were instances where certain types of information could have been made public at, at earlier stages than they were, and that that information was making it difficult for the public to understand exactly what was going, going to happen. So in one example, in, in the case of uh, the Canada Line, this was an, uh, some different research. Uh, this is a big subway project in Vancouver. Um, the public actually uh, wasn't aware of the construction method that they were going to use to build the project. Uh, it had been assumed that the project was going to be built through through uh, what's called deep bore tunneling, me uh, uh, meaning that essentially the project's built underground. And when the project was announced, it turned out the project was built using a method called cut and cover, which is essentially you build a trench, you sink in all of the equipment, and then you fill in the trench, a much more disruptive method. And that became really a point, a flashpoint of controversy uh, and contention in the community. And I think to your broader comment then about what do we do about this need to balance confidentiality with transparency, I think your idea of having some agency, whether it's the Auditor General or, or someone else, who's responsible for looking over the plans and providing a public verdict from an independent perspective on, uh, on this broader comment of whether it meets the public interest, not value for money, that's a much narrower term but the public interest, I think would be something that would be very effective. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to be you know, a huge uh, public inquiry that takes a ton of time, but it's, it's the type of check that I think will help to give the public confidence in a context where you have had these instances where you've had long-term lock-ins and contracts that in some cases have not been as advantageous uh, for the public as they could be. Um, I actually have a follow-on to that, and that is um, if you were to make the public, um, sir, make public the community benefits agreement, mm -hmm. that might go some way as well. So if the community knows what the community benefits are that are being sought, that sometimes helps. Is that is that a reasonable process here? The community benefit, I think, uh, is, is a key approach. I'm really pleased that Ray uh, spoke about that. Uh, we have, I think, the biggest community benefit agreement going in, in Ontario on a public-private partnership. It's on the uh, Eglinton Crosstown. Um, the results have been, I think it's fair to say, slower than expected, but still they are in play. The deal is in place. Uh, and, and, and I think having that public, in addition to the details of the contract, uh, is important. And the last thing I'll say on this is, Confidentiality is only is, is, is time specific. And what we've done in Ontario and they've done in British Columbia, and I think Nova Scotia would be, if you don't already do this, I think would be something important too, is once the information is not needed to be confidential, it should be released. So for example, we've released the, a value for money study. Once it's no longer confidential, we release uh, the, contra the original contract. So you can pour through it. These things are 3,000 uh, pages and, and more. You, know, it's, it's, you, don't have a con you don't have like a contract drawer anymore. You have a contract room. Uh, but it is made public, so people who want to scrutinize it can go and do that. It lends itself to transparency, and I think that's really, uh, really important. Okay, the second student question will come from Allison Hurd. Hi there. Thank you for your presentations. This question is for Maddie. The ability to transfer risk is often presented as one of the main arguments for uh, pursuing P3s. How can government do better in identifying and allocating risk to the sector that's best positioned to management at the least amount of cost? Uh, that is the fundamental question of public-private partnerships. If you attend uh, the big public-private partnership conference uh, that will be taking place in, in two weeks uh, uh, in Toronto, the big ca uh, Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships, or you go overseas, the saying that you will hear over and over again is transfer risk to the party that's best able to manage it. You will hear that over and over and over again. The early public-private partnerships in Canada, we tried to transfer all risks. Government became risk-averse, and they thought the way that we'll deal with this is by handing everything to the private sector. 
then what happens is you pay more because no, no risk is taken on for free, either in your personal life or in, uh, or in, uh, uh, in professional practice. And so there were huge costs. And then when things failed, it just reverberated and came back to government. There, with public-private partnerships, there are essentially three kinds of risk. There's construction risk, the risk of cost overruns and delays. There's availability risk, the risk that the facility doesn't work the way it's supposed to or isn't maintained well enough. And there's demand risk, the risk that it doesn't have as much users or doesn't make as much money. I would say what we've learned in Canada, and we've been very effective at this, the early PPPs tried to transfer all three of those risks. That created inflexibility and problems. The latest PPPs, construction risk, that can be transferred for the most part to the private sector. Availability risk, we can share that risk in various ways. Demand risk is the key one where we've run into trouble. That's the risk that you don't have as many users. That should be maintained with government other than under the most, under the most specific conditions. Uh, but for, for most infrastructure, I would maintain demand and revenue risk with government. It keeps the flexibility in the long term to be able to make uh, changes to the facility and, and balances out uh, the public interest with uh, the need to ensure that risks are well managed. Okay, and Paul LaFleche, you had a comment to follow on that? Yeah, in, in that type of question, I'm not saying this was your, your assumption, but a lot of people assume that uh, risk is best dealt with in the private sector. I'm not sure that's true. For instance, in a lot of the services we deliver, the best people to deliver those services are government. So the type of risk we want to transfer is not all risk. In fact, I always feel there's a risk of transferring too much risk. Mm -hmm. So we want to, in some cases, like the risk of, deli I'll tell you, the risk of deli delivering clinical services mm -hmm. is much better left with clinicians that work for the government than it is with private in Canada with private clinicians. So uh, that's where we are. So we've got to be careful about what risk we transfer and how we define it. And that's where not everything is the same. Each one you have to look at in a different way. But I don't want to transfer too much risk if I feel that risk is more manageable in government mm -hmm. because the risk of transferring too much risk could be my risk in the end. I know that's a hard one to swallow. Okay, the third question goes to Reagan Seidler. Great, Darrell. I'm going to direct this to Ray. Uh, picking up on the bad press you mentioned, if we were to look into any of those headlines, uh, I think we would see that the origin of those criticisms are coming from Canada's public sector unions. So I'd like you to, to unpack that a bit. Do you think that the issue is that uh, Canada's public sector unions are, are criticizing P3s in good faith because they want to see different sorts of projects? Or underlying this, is this a political issue? And we would see that notwithstanding what concessions or changes Paul might bring to the table, uh, the unions are going to continue to criticize P3s because they know it's an easy way to rally support for themselves and potentially uh, favorable governments. I'm going, to dis sorry. I'm going to disagree with you that unions are critical of the P3 model. Uh, honestly, in research preparation today, I, mm -hmm. Spaceship landing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure I understood the union perspective on this. And you said public unions, and I, I just saw one or two comments from one of the national public sector unions that's not involved in construction. So if they're not involved in construction, you know, what perspective do they have to comment on it? Other than it's tax dollars, I guess, it's, you know, at risk at the end of the day. I can tell you, uh, from the perspective of construction unions, they don't have any problem with P3 construction. The main interest of construction unions in this country is to gain employment. Construction workers aren't guaranteed that there's gonna be work for them every day. Unlike if you work for perhaps in a government office or a business office, construction workers only work when there's projects that are ongoing. There's work to be performed. So there's a keen interest in the construction industry unions to make sure projects go ahead. They're not particularly concerned about how they're financed. At least, that's not a major concern. The interest is to obtain employment, to work safely, and have an environment where they can perform the work efficiently. And sure, at the end of the day, they also have an interest to make sure tax dollars are spent effectively. But I can tell you the construction unions, their interest is create work. And I, I will say anecdotally, I have heard uh, from a number of people 
both management side and union side, that they find on P3 projects sometimes uh, the sometimes it can be a little cumbersome compared to other projects because uh, they see that sometimes there's a uh, in a cumbersome level of additional oversight which comes from the government which doesn't necessarily have an expertise in construction that's why they rely on the private partner uh, so this happens sometimes and it's been expressed to me on a number of different projects so Okay, I have uh, two questions that I've already seen from the floor. The first one is the gentleman right here in the second row on the edge. And after that, if you could pass the microphone to over. I'd like each person, when they ask a question, to provide their name and their organization um, for the audience to know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Govan Rao, and I'm a Queen's University Public Administration, Public Science, uh, Public Political Science alumnus. I also taught public administration at McMaster University as a faculty member. And I'm currently the research advisory chair of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives here in Nova Scotia. And I'm also the Atlantic Regional Researcher for the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'm going to, I prepared my comments so they'll be kept short. I'm not going to. Okay, because we really do want questions, I, I, not comments. I do understand. Yes. And I, um, I think that the, my, I do end it with a question. I think that the, the, the important thing is, is that from, I mean, our, our friend's question before, from the perspective of CUPE, it's about dollars not being wasted that could go into services. And the devil is in the details. So the first question that I have in terms of public-private uh, partnerships is in terms of why the secrecy. And in provinces like Ontario, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, the methodology for when to use a P3 is actually released as a public document. Uh, and we don't have that in Nova Scotia, and there's a question, why? Secondly, in British Columbia, they will release the request for proposals for projects that are not yet closed. Whereas in Nova Scotia, what we've heard is that only the request for qualifications is released, and we can't see the request uh, for proposals. Thirdly. Uh, okay, um, I'm just going to stop yeah. you there. You're asking speakers to remember too much. So, sure. who would you like to comment on this? Uh, I would like whichever, Paul, whichever person on the panel would like to. Okay. And the question is just most simply, does, uh, does releasing the request for proposals before a contract is closed compromise the competitive process? And would methodology being really like uh, having a methodology for when to pursue P3s be a good idea? Thank you for your time. Okay, so I'm going to actually ask uh, both of uh, the speakers on this end of the table to take a crack at that. Okay. Um, this has been an ongoing discussion about uh, what to release and when. I would say in Ontario, um, it took a lot of debate and discussion, and it took uh, the public calling for, uh, uh, for, for these uh, reports to be released and these reports to be produced uh, in order for it to happen. And I think it's been, it has been a very good step. Um, having all that information in the public realm, I will say, is not a panacea in and of itself. Um, you then have to have a way of making sense of what it all means, and that has not always been easy. Um, as I said, there are now thousands of pages that are released. Um, we still don't always have the actual risk registries that tell you really what's behind a lot of those documents, so a lot of them are still summary, uh, which can be a bit of a challenge, but we have moved further down the path towards uh, transparency in Ontario. Uh, and from my vantage point, I think more, uh, more light on these matters allows everyone to uh, have access to them, to debate uh, openly so that everyone has the same information. Uh, and I think open debate uh, on these matters leads to better policy. So I, uh, I, and I haven't seen the reasons why not releasing them uh, challenges the process, at least on the risk registry, or risk matrix type of documents, and to some extent the, the, the um, uh, request for proposals too. I think that type of information, uh, when it's appropriate, uh, should be released. Uh, I think uh, earlier, I think Maddie made some points around the timing of the yep. release, and that's really what we're discussing here because at the end of the day, it's released. Mm -hmm. So it, we're really talking about at what moment in the process things are released. And, um, you know, we're doing uh, a few right now, and uh, we'll see how that goes and review that at the end like Ontario did and see if we've got the right release points on it. But uh, at the end of the day, those things will be released. So it's just about what minute in time 
Right, I think, I think uh, our, our question was asking whether there was a fixed policy or whether that's in development. Uh, I would say everything about, everything I do in my job is in development. How is that a good, <laughs> or a good answer? I don't know that, uh, you know, uh, we're always in a learning mode. You know, uh, a fixed policy on anything is probably never a good thing because if you provided a fixed result, it's probably the end of the universe. <laughs> okay, the next question from the audience. Hello, it's Grant Bergman from Halifax. Uh, no organizations. Uh, what I want to talk about is the environmental impact studies that haven't been mentioned today. The question is to Matty. Uh, Andy Fillmore put a private member's bill to tie 90% of federal funds to environmental study. The exemptions were transportation, uh, shipping, airlines, and railways. Mm -hmm. What is the Nova Scotia policy on taxpayers' dollars to P3s and environmental impact studies? We're talking about long-term investments and long-term environmental impacts. And wh wh we haven't talked about that today. Can you talk about that? Um, so I can't speak to the Nova Scotia policies um, uh, since I haven't, I haven't looked into those in great detail, but I can speak to... Uh, the broader context of, of environmental issues with public-private partnerships. The key is which types of projects get selected. Uh, what we've seen globally is that public-private partnerships tend to support, at least let's take the transportation sector, they tend to support projects uh, that are in uh, more heavily polluting sectors like uh, ports and airports and roads primarily because those sectors have a revenue stream uh, from user fees of various degrees, whether it's a toll uh, or, um, uh, or an airport improvement fee uh, or a shipping charge that can then be used to, to, get, to increase uh, uh, the, the uh, capacity to do those type of deals. Um, we've seen less public-private partnerships on transit projects, although that's now changing, uh, but it requires public funding. That is the key for, for projects like public transit to get those projects built, whether through public-private partnerships or any other type of mechanism, because they can't pay for themselves through user fees alone. The fare box, nowhere in Canada, pays for the full cost of, of, the, of the asset, uh, operations and maintenance plus capital. Um, it needs government funding. Uh, and, and so uh, we've seen, we've, we're starting to see those projects come online and more of them being built uh, through public private partnerships, not always particularly effectively. In fact, we've had a number of projects now that have been uh, delayed uh, and, and had some budget issues. Um, and if you've followed the Ottawa LRT project, which has just recently opened, uh, it's having at least some uh, uh, ramping up problems, uh, I guess you could charitably call it. Um, so this model is not foolproof for uh, transit projects, but I think we really need to be focusing on, uh, I agree with you on the environmental dynamics, we need to be focusing on how we make sure at the project level that the, the contractors are incentivized to use the best environmental technologies. Uh, the way that you do that is by including it in the bid, in the, in the RFP. If, if environmental, uh, the, the contractors in public-private partnerships will design their bids and design their facilities in ways that respond to exactly what the government is asking for. So if the government says, we will be providing points on your bid for uh, environmental performance, for energy, for lower energy usage, then the contractors will come and try to optimize the building for that criteria. If that's not in the bid, it will be very secondary. And it's really, we, we find that very specifically when we, I've done studies where we've reviewed the actual uh, different bids between, the different designs between the contractors, and they respond very differently depending on what they're incentivized to do. I think for the environment, that needs to be a criteria in the bid that we're gonna be evaluating the bids based on their environmental performance. Okay, the third question. Are you ready to? Yeah. Uh, hi, Chris Parsons. I'm from the Nova Scotia Health Coalition, and I'm, I believe, the source of a lot of the quotes in the, uh, the stuff from the slides that Ray Mitchell put up, and I don't work for a public sector union. Um, my question, uh, I guess, is uh, concerns the question of risk transfer. And one of them is, uh, the, basically my question is, to what degree has the theoretical proposition that P3 agreements transfer risk from the public sector to the private sector, in fact, actually played out in practice um, over the last several decades. Because one of the problems is these are long-term projects, so it still remains in a lot of ways a theoretical assumption that before the, like these contracts are up that we've gotten a good deal out of them. When in reality, we've seen, for example, uh, the collapse of Carillion in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, which is a major player in the uh, private finance initiatives there. Um, 
where it cost over a quarter billion dollars in direct costs immediately after their collapse to the UK government. Even in, uh, in Canada, uh, the SNC-Lavalin-led group uh, that built the McGill uh, University Hospital Centre and the University of Montreal Hospital Centre, despite the fact that the, their construction delays were related to allegations still being partially tried in court, some of which convicted of corruption, uh, led to delays that that cost almost a quarter billion dollars of the Quebec government paying them out there. So it actually appears as even when... Uh, um, could you crystallize your question? Well, even in the cases, it seems like evidence-wise, even in cases where clearly the private interest or the reason why there has been a massive risk that has to be taken on by the private or the public sector, that the public sector and government actually are the ones that pay for it. So is there actually evidence over the course of these contracts that the risk transfer works or does it still remain a theoretical proposition? That's for um, Deputy Minister LaFleche as well as Dr. Simia Teki. Okay. <laughs> so it's a historical question, and we haven't built our stuff yet. So, <laughs> in the um, hospital, in the healthcare. Area. So, uh, it still really uh, remains to be seen. It's, and what I will say is, uh, this will go inside baseball and, and academia. It's been very hard to study this uh, from a from a truly independent and impartial way. We don't have access to the internal data that you would need in order to assess whether risk has actually been transferred. And uh, wh what I agree with you on is that risk transferred on paper is not necessarily risk transferred in practice. Uh, and we need to be able to go back and do, uh, we do a lot of work um, po uh, pre-implementation to study what what is likely to happen. And we do a lot less work where we go back after the fact to say what actually did happen. So a few things that we do know. Canada has not had uh, many of the, the, the issues around bankruptcies uh, and major renegotiations of projects uh, for projects that have been built, what I would call in the second wave of public-private partnerships. The first wave of projects built in the 90s and into the early 2000s, those projects, many of them did have challenges, including your Nova Scotia schools uh, example. Uh, I would say that we would, there's a distinction between projects planned uh, probably after the mid-2000s those projects, for the most part, have not had the same types of challenges in terms of operations, um, and we haven't seen the same types of major collapses and bankruptcies yet. Although there is now a project in, I think it's Cambridge, Ontario, that is having a problem with its construction, so it's not infallible. And there was one in Oakville that got to the debt uh, holders, where it went to the bond holders uh, to say, you need to sort this out because it's not going very well. So we've had some, but we really need to be using independent ex uh, uh, a study at a large scale. We, have, we must have 50 hospitals in Canada that are up and running, and we shouldn't be cherry picking one or two or three either the ones that are the best examples or the ones that are the worst. We need a systematic study across the country that's done independently. Um, my colleagues and I have tried to start that study. It's been impossible to get the data. We would love to do that study independently uh, and release it, or it can be someone else, that's fine. But I think that study does need to be done, and um, if there's any uh, way of getting that going, we'd be pleased to be involved. I'm not seeing any other questions for hand, so, uh, okay, Sean. Hi, my name is uh, Sean McDonald. I'm a transportation consultant with uh, CPCS. I've been working on PPPs, mostly in the urban transit sector and mostly internationally for the last uh, 15 years. Um, I just moved here, removed back here uh, a year ago, and I was really surprised at the antipathy to PPPs here. Uh, I know it had been 20 years ago. I was surprised to see it still continued. Uh, making documents transparent or making doc documents public is, is one way of, uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword, because uh, people can pick apart those documents and come up with endless criticisms for them. But it also improves uh, PPPs by, uh, how do you put it, the Darwinian process. You see what works and you see the documents behind it, and you can use that to improve your own documents. My question is, what else could be done uh, from the public perception point of view uh, to make uh, PPPs more palatable? Uh, this is for anybody who wants to answer. Well, I'll take that. Okay. I think we're doing it right now. We're having a, a good education seminar on this where we're all learning. I've learned some things today, and I think other people have. Of course, there are some people with fixed opinions, but in general, most of the public doesn't know a lot about this subject. And I put up a, a little chart earlier of a spectrum. One might argue instead of being a one-dimensional spectrum, it's two, three, or four dimensions. I'll leave that to the academics here. Maybe there's a future paper on how many dimensions there are. But, um, you know, it's a complicated subject. And a lot of the stuff that we do now is really a P3, would be defined as a P3 
but most of the public thinks it's conventional. They just don't understand where we are in the spectrum. So a lot of this is about education. What are we actually looking to do and how are we doing it? What are the risks that we're taking? Um, when is it appropriate? When is it not appropriate? So I think events like this and other events, I've heard uh, Maddie was on the radio a couple of times, and those are good things. We need to talk about what we're doing and how government usually does things because they don't really know what we're doing in, at the base case. So it, it's, it's kind of tough to say, you know, we criticize P3s, but actually we are always doing P3s. It's just the level of P3 or the type of P3 that varies. So that's it, that's my answer. More public education, more discussion, more debate, more informed opinion. I agree the more we talk about uh, infrastructure delivery in general and the more knowledgeable our uh, uh, communities are, the better. Um, you'll notice we're having this whole conversation about public-private partnerships. We haven't had this conversation about traditional build projects and both the strengths that they have and also the challenges. Um, one of uh, the experiences of my, uh, myself and some of the researchers I work with is, in, in, at least in Ontario, it's easier to get data on public-private partnerships than it is on traditional build projects. If you want to try to get the, pro the data from the government on how they've done build it directly building a subway uh, or building a hospital or building another type of infrastructure, that has been almost impossible. And the, the public-private partnership uh, uh, agencies, because of the scrutiny, because of the, uh, I would argue, because they've had to respond to this level of uh, debate, they've had to up their game and be better. And I think we should be focusing not on delivering good public-private partnerships, but on delivering good infrastructure. And in order to do that, we need to be debating and discussing all of the models that are uh, available to us. And I think uh, Paul made a comment earlier where he said, uh, we need to know when we use pub we should use public-private partnerships and also when we shouldn't. And I think this is the key argument that in many contexts uh, that have had the worst outcomes, it's because the public-private partnership is the only game in town for a variety of reasons, whether it's because the government feels like it's broke or because there's a, 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 a view that the government, that the private sector is more efficient than, uh, than the government. They have made it so that you can only get money for your project if it's done through a PPP. And that is where a lot of the antipathy towards this model has come from, that people feel like something is being pushed upon them and that it's the only way they're ever going to get their projects built. I think we can do a lot better than that by really raising our, our level of discourse about uh, how we uh, deliver projects. And the last point is I think out of this discussion that we're having uh, and out of the community's uh, concern about the public-private partnerships, you will push your politicians and, and encourage the civil service to get a better deal. Just one quick point. We've seen this work uh, where I am in, in, in Toronto. You may have heard of a project called the Sidewalk Labs project. This is a smart city project on the Toronto waterfront that in some ways nominally was supposed to be a public-private partnership. It became very controversial about uh, how much land was involved and how much the private sector, uh, how much data was going to be collected. Uh, and uh, when the project started, the, the, the both parties, the government and the private sector, thought this is going to be a great thing. The community said, we are intrigued, but we want you to do this better and we want you, the government to stand up for the public and protect the public interest. And the deal that just came out last week because of the public uh, pushback and because of the debate, both critical and constructive, led to a better project and a better outcome. And I think you can get the same thing with public-private partnerships here. Um, I'm just uh, realizing we only have time for one last question. So Paul, I'll, uh, okay. I'll uh, t turn it over to our if, one If your time question. is short, I needn't ask it. Um, <clears throat> my name is Norm Dunker. I'm recently retired, not forcibly so, from SNC-Lavalin. <laughs> <clears throat> We've been involved in a number of P3 projects. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the points that I wish to support or reiterate is uh, Dr. Simiotikis, and that has to do with expertise. Um, often we see on the other side, in the government side, very young, often inexperienced, and sometimes in order to make the point, they tend to be a little bit too forceful. So there uh, develops a kind of a master-slave relationship. Another one is trust. Now, the third one is collaboration, and the fourth point would be authority. When you deal with two people, the right person has to have authority. Business tends not to like to wait. They tend to like to see a decision made reasonably quickly. Regrettably, often that requires the legal, uh, our legal uh, brethren. Um, so that's all that I wish to say, but I'd like to support the point about uh, expertise and, that, and the necessity on both sides of the table to have that level of expertise. 
Yes, so Paul. I'll wrap up with that. So it's important to know what you don't know. And uh, if you haven't done a lot of P3s, you may not know enough. So uh, I know in our case, uh, Gary Porter sitting over there and Stephen McIsaac up there, and we've had to do a lot of learning. And you have to look at, we've had to go elsewhere. We have to go to BC. At one time we had a partnership with the P3 BC. And um, you know, we're, we're a long way from knowing what we need to know. But you gotta start somewhere, right? Because the P3 at some element on the right side of that spectrum is a useful option. You've got to keep those options open. So we have to develop skills in that area whether we like it or not. Otherwise, we're not delivering the true value to the citizens of Nova Scotia that needs to be delivered in terms of the variety of projects that need to be done here. Uh, I will point out that one of the greatest uh, P3s in Canadian history um, were the railroads. And I'm wearing a pin of the 100th anniversary of CNN. I just noticed CN, not CNN. <laughs> um, and uh, those were uh, really P3s a long, long time ago. And today people don't think of them as that. And I know CN has since been privatized. It was nationalized uh, in, in, eight, in ni uh, 1919 when a lot of different railroads went bankrupt. It came together. CP has been a private railroad ever since. It was a P3. The, uh, in the classical sense, it was one of the original transportation P3s. And those are viewed as great successes. And if we didn't have those today, and the government of the day couldn't afford and didn't have the expertise to build those railroads, we would not have the country we have now today. So there are examples when we're here because of P3s. So we have to know when to use them and when not to use them. I think that's a great note to end on. Please uh, thank our speakers today. They did a great job.